Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Oh, uh, what's in the box? And Big Anklevich. Who's in the box? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Holiday Spectacular Part 2 of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and I don't know if we can guarantee spectacular. Is there more than one definition of spectacular, like just a big thing? It's spectacle, I think, is what it comes from, so... Oh, so it's got to have spectacle? Well, it's got a little... Boobies! <laughs> yes! Oh, thank you, folks. Bring on the dancing girls. We're here. We're doing this thing. <laughs> I don't know if Rish feels, uh, he was saying he's on his way into another sickness. Uh, he just came out of his old one. I am definitely on my way into another sickness. So hopefully I don't suck. I will try to keep the energy up. But I'm afraid that I have none. We're going to reward <coughs> ourselves with food after this. So that we can do the spectacular That Gets My Goat episode. <laughs> but yeah, this will be fairly rare especially for 2016, uh, we're going to have two episodes in a super short amount of time, hoping to make it by Christmas. Um, but yeah, just our schedules have combined to defeat us <laughs> yeah. so that we can't get together. And This week has been a hellacious week as far as scheduling goes, but uh, we managed to work it in anyway. So that's cool. Maybe we should just do that all the time. What do you think? Just schedule like this is the... January 15th spectacular so we actually like work hard and get it done <laughs> instead of just being like no not gonna be able to get together this week sorry uh, I don't know because <laughs> getting stuff out on time took a lot out of me yeah. and eventually I'll hit the point where I'm like you know what January 15th of next year <laughs> goodbye I just feel like I don't celebrate January 15th in my religion, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not a 15ist. Okay, so uh, we got a couple of stories for you today. I, I, I don't know. Did you already say that? Yeah, we've got two stories, one by each of us, one by Rich Outfield, one by Big Anklevich. And talk about a rare occasion. <laughs> this is a new story that I wrote. Shoot, I wrote it like last week. I think we're both in the same boat there. We gave everybody a prompt back in the end of November for a sort of broken mirror holiday event. And uh, if you want to hear what other people had to say about it, our last episode is right there. What did you call it? I call it Holiday Episode Part 1. Part 1, okay. This one will be called Holiday Episode Part 2. And the prompt, the broken mirror premise this time around was... No one knew... Where the present came from. No name was written on the box. That's you, how I hear the Lego <laughs> Batman voice that Will Arnett does. It just bugs the sh... Uh, it's I wonderful. I hate this place. It's adorable. First try. Oh, Big, I gotta interrupt you. As you well know, something always goes wrong on these episodes. We'll push stop instead of start on the recorder. The battery will run out. The... Space will fill up on the recorder. There'll be some kind of static recorded. I remember an occasion where somebody didn't push record and just sat there enjoying while Gino and me, sorry, while the other participants did record. You know, there's always something like that going on. How? And in this case, we screwed up again. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean we screwed up? For the last episode where it was the audience participation I guess we screwed up and missed one of the stories. Uh, are you sure it was us that screwed up? Because I went through the entire email account while we were doing that episode. We went from one to the next to the next. And I didn't see anything from Gino. Well, actually, he, uh, he sent it to me directly. And so when we were looking through the emails, we weren't looking in my personal email account. Aha! I knew it. All right, all right. Well, you know what? What? Gino's a good guy, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and we will use his story anyways. Okay. 
Can we run his first? So yeah, here's... Uh, does this have a name? Let me check it real fast. I think it's called The Box. As in, what's in the, the box. box? All right, okay. So we'll use his, uh, his story after all. We'll give him a chance. Uh, so here it is, The Box by Gino Moretto. The Box by Gino Moretto. No one knew who the present was from. No name was written on the box. The inscription, roughly written in black ink on one of the wooden slats, only said, To Nicholas, with warmest regards. The elves peered at the package warily. A squat wooden crate, boards simple and unrefined, sat near the doors to the workshop. It seemed an unremarkable thing, and yet none of them wished to go near it. A malevolence lingered around it, but none could have explained why. Nicholas was sent for. He arrived promptly. A grimace briefly pulled at the corners of his mouth as he saw the box, but he put on a bright smile before the elves could see. No point in causing undue distress. Oh ho, a gift for me? Now this is a welcome surprise. He boomed, his voice all happiness and joy. He turned to two of the more senior elves. Nancy, Franklin, would you please take this to my private workshop? The rest of you, back to work now. It's only a handful of days left till Christmas. It's no time to lollygag. The two elves hauled the crate past the teams of their fellows, who laboured on their ethereal constructions, soon to be given out on Christmas. Inspirational dreams, comforting memories, bolstering humours. Depositing the box in the spacious workroom, Nancy and Franklin left with Nicholas's thanks, relieved to get away from the container, which filled them with subtle dread. Nicholas sat on a bench and gazed at the box sadly. How quickly the 6th of December came. The day after Krampusnacht. The day after his brother had had his fun. Taking up a crowbar from a rack of tools, he prized open the lid of the box and lifting it with his strong arms, tipped it upside down. A mass of groaning, whimpering bodies impossibly fell from the crate and tumbled to the floor. Nicholas counted them as they untangled themselves. Thirteen, as usual. Eight girls, five boys. None older than sixteen, none younger than twelve. The thirteen most naughty children, the ones who had made the very first page of his list. His cursed gift of coals, bringing misfortune and misery, was not enough punishment for them. Nor was the beating with his birch staff though all bore the welts and bruises of that. No, something far more damning for them. Poor wretches, Nicholas muttered. When their shock had faded to a manageable level, the children spoke. Where are we? What happened? Where's my mum? I want to go home. Nicholas held up his hands. Please listen to what I am about to tell you. It will save you from unnecessary suffering, Nicholas said to them, his voice soft and sincere. You are here because of your selfishness and cruelty. You are the worst children in the entire world. Understand, I do not say this to hurt you. It is an unfortunate truth. Nicholas could already see understanding dawn in the eyes of some of them. The younger ones, they were always the quickest to accept. And he could already tell who would serve as the example to his new charges. The older girl, his magic revealing her name to him. Charlotte. Though her bleached blonde hair was torn out in places and her face seriously bruised, she held on to her haughty sneer while he tried to explain. He already knew it would be her. 
You have been stripped of your humanity by my brother. You will spend the rest of your lives making gifts for good boys and girls here in my workshop. You can't make me do anything, you sick freak. Charlotte spat. Just wait till I call my dad. He's a lawyer. You'll be the one serving a life sentence. Nicholas continued. Work hard and behave, and you'll be treated well and rewarded. Rewarded? How? A younger boy, Jackson, asked, lip trembling. With forgetting, Nicholas answered. None of you exist in your old worlds any longer. Your parents have no memories of you. No one remembers you. This is your only existence now. It doesn't need to be a bad one, though. I will show you what kindness I can. The hell you will, pervert! Charlotte said in a dangerous hiss. I'm not doing anything, you tell me. I won't make you do anything, Nicholas said to her. But if you fight your curse, it will only bring you pain. Children, see how already her ears have begun to lengthen. Her teeth are now more pointed. Only the beginning. Keep rebelling, and it won't be long before your bodies are twisted and ruined. Your every movement pained. Please... Do as I ask, not for my sake, but for your own. Charlotte ran her hands over her face, finding the new points to her ears and teeth. Her vanity would not allow for this marring of her form. She hefted an iron hammer from a table nearby. What have you done to me? She shrieked at Nicholas. I have done nothing. You did this. Put down the hammer. Charlotte. You bastard! She screamed. I'll kill you! Please, he implored. Don't. She ran towards him, rearing back the hammer. Nicholas closed his eyes. He didn't want to see it happen again. As soon as Charlotte began to swing the hammer towards his head, she fell, her screams changing instantly from rage to agony. The others drew away from her as she convulsed, her cries shifting to retching gurgles as she began to vomit up a stream of coals. They rattled and clattered on the floor, pointed and sharp-edged. They watched in horror as her body shriveled, her unblemished skin becoming a slate grey, her blonde locks falling from her head in clumps, lips peeling back to reveal shark-like fangs caked in coal dust. After what seemed an eternity, her disgorging lessened and ceased, the only sound now an occasional mewling sob. Nicholas wiped away a tear before opening his eyes, took a deep breath to steady the tremble in his voice before he spoke. Punishment is swift. You can no more escape your fate than I can. I beg you not to try. He moved to the door, opened it. Follow me, please. There is much work to be done. Wordlessly, his new elves left with him as Charlotte began to cry. He would return for her later, after she had time to adjust. Then... Well, probably the furnaces for her. Goblins were better suited to the less delicate jobs, and it was best to keep them away from the regular labourers as much as possible. A happy workplace was an untroubled workplace, after all. The End All right, okay, so there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. That was The Box by Gino Moretto. You know, I thought that was really, uh, that was that was kind of a really good story. It was really creepy, huh? The whole uh, <laughs> evil naughty children become elves or goblins. 
as you know, as you well know, I despise children. And uh, when he introduced like the naughtiest children on the planet, I thought it would end up being, you know, that sanitized Nick Jr. sort of naughtiness and not the true dark malevolence of actual children. Because, yeah, if you had the six or seven or ten worst kids on the face of the earth in a room, you would seal up the room, encase it in concrete, and then and just run as fast as you could away from that room. But that's just my... I almost said opinion. That's my experience talking. Uh, one thing that I really liked about the story... Well, well, oh, yeah, I was getting with on that. Was the genuine nastiness of Charlotte. It wasn't a sanitized nastiness. And, you know, all three of our stories today are less than are less than kid friendly less than nick jr ready and you don't often find that in christmas stories because people feel like oh well you know uh, it's got to be something that you watch over and over and over again every year and trot them out when the family gets together for the holidays i remember there being a stink when christmas story was new that it was far far too adult and uh trying to remember who in my family complained about the language and the Christmas story. Um, because, yes, they do say fudge a couple times. All right. You know what I think is funny? Uh, I'm pretty sure, and I know I've blown this before and mixed Gino up with somebody else once when we talked about him on a different time on the show, but I'll try not to do that this time. I'm pretty sure that Gino is a teacher. Yes. So I wonder... If he knows a real Charlotte and a real Jackson. I wonder if this story is close to his heart. You know, the 13 most naughty children in the world. Has Gino met any of those kids, you think? Well, I certainly have. Yeah, it's a it's a funny thing being a teacher. Just, I don't know. It's funny because that's something that I considered doing with my life. Oh, uh, you should have. Because, you know, there's a lot of positives, a lot of perks, if you know what I'm saying. You know, if you... Uh, None. You get all of summer off, although, does it work that way in New Zealand? Do they get summer or do they get winter? Well, their summer is our winter. They probably does, get both. I don't know how that works. The uh, southern hemisphere changes things, right? I know that your toilet water flows in reverse, although I I've heard that, that, that that's a myth. myth. No, that is a myth. Like the uh, the hanging munchkin in Wizard of Oz, or uh, the wage gap, or that idea that if you drop a penny off of the Empire State Building, it would kill someone, or Mark Hamill saying Carrie in Star Wars. You know, it, myths. Uh, sorry, I interrupted. I, I, You go go right ahead. Um, anyways, teacher. Uh, yeah, you get, you know, summer off, you get all the holidays off, you get a spring break. Uh, depending on where you live, you might get deer hunt weekend off, like you do around here. <laughs> <laughs> deer hunt. But yeah, that's kind of attractive all those perks but yeah then there's having to deal with the 13 most naughty children in the world how hard is that gonna be would it have been worth it or would i just want to have killed myself i don't know i know that i often want to kill myself with the job that i do have so you know maybe maybe it would have been any different maybe it would have been just as good or better so yeah, you're you're morettoed if you do, and you're morettoed if you don't. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what did you think of, you know, the 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 premise behind this? The, not the premise behind it, because obviously that's what we gave him. But you know, the the idea that Santa Claus gets the box and it's creepy elves. Oh, I loved that. I I, I like the creepiness of it. It's kind of got a rough edge, and yet it doesn't make Santa into a monster. It's just like, hey, these are rules. And if you go bad enough, if you break the rules, uh, even Santa can't help you. I don't know. There's something kind of powerful about that. Santa is usually depicted as an omnipotent character. And uh, yet, there's no longer the cloud hanging over children of, you know, the naughtiness of the coal, of et cetera, et cetera. And so it was refreshing. Thank you, Gino. But besides Gino going full cast on this thing, I honestly thought that it was Gino doing the voices, doing all the voices. Uh, because the Santa, he seemed to have a different accent than the narrator. 
And then, but then you know you hear a, a female voice, and I think, well, Gino's talented, but is he that talented? Uh, he was the narrator. A guy named Matt Cohen's was Nicholas. A guy named Debbie Cohen's was Charlotte, and uh, we used uh, Kevin McLeod's Creative Commons music in our stories today. Uh, Kevin McLeod is the friend of the podcaster. At least that's what I always say. So so he went all out. And you and I probably would have gone all out, too, if uh, various disasters hadn't prevented it. But there was this disaster. And then, <laughs> I'm going to throw this in just so people know. This is a reshoot, obviously, uh, this part with Gino's story. I say a reshoot, although we're not shooting anything. But I mentioned sometimes the uh, battery will run out on my Zoom. And so we've uh, we've started recording by plugging the zoom into the auxiliary port, into the cigarette lighter of the car, when we aren't able to go to Big's house to record. And we recorded our episodes, got him out of the way, and Big was exhausted and sick, and he had to be up early for work the next day. And we tried to start the engine, and the recorder had drained the battery. So what we had to do was walk to where my car was parked, and then get in that car, and we were frozen by that point, drive back to where Big had parked, and I jumped Big's car with, you know, with cables. So it it doesn't really affect the episode. It just adds more exasperation, more white hairs to your fine Dune Steve hosts. So feel free to donate to the show if your heartstrings were tugged by this or other stories. All right, well... There you go. So now on to what we actually are here for. So today, I just saw this thing that somebody posted on Facebook. I thought it was pretty funny where it was Liam Neeson trying out to be the mall Santa. So they show Liam Neeson and he puts on the hat and then he goes, I know when you're sleeping and I know when you're awake. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, um... Why don't you try it a little more jolly, okay? Like, like, think Santa. And he just keeps going like that. But is it actually Liam Neeson? Yeah, it's really oh, Liam Neeson. Cool. They got him for, I, I want to say it was the Colbert show. So I, I think that's where it came from. But yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. Later on, he like ad- adapts. So he's like, I'm watching you while you're sleeping. Or <laughs> just something even creepier. Yeah, it's like the the big wars that uh, we had at my work when somebody put up a picture of Santa over the urinal that said Santa is, is watch- always watching. And I- <laughs> now, sorry, let's talk about this because this is a delightful story, and it will it will entertain generations to come. Long after you and I are gone and forgotten, this story will continue to be told. And we don't have hard evidence that this is the man that did it, but we have strong suspicions. That a very upstanding, humorless, religious guy <laughs> that works at your your station put up this photograph, this this drawing of Santa Claus right over the urinal. <laughs> and it, yeah, if you come from another country, urinal. So whilst urinating, urinating, you would look at this and it says Santa is always watching. <laughs> and. I just didn't get it. I, I mean, I get it if you have a sense of humor. I get it if you're like, oh, you've got a little one, don't you? <laughs> but I don't get it if you have no sense of humor and you're super uptight about religion and penises. <laughs> Let me explain to you why this man would have put this here. Okay. Obviously, first of all, the, the myth of Santa Claus is that he's watching you and he knows if you've been bad or good and he only rewards those who have been good, right? Those who are not naughty. And uh, this guy has sometimes gets a little irritated when he goes into the bathroom and there is like paper towels all over the floor or some asshole has spit their gum into the urinal or something like that where it's just like, dude... The gum is not coming out unless somebody uses their fingers to get it or their teeth, depending on who it might be. You know, he gets upset with that. And I think that was his purpose is don't be naughty. Clean up after yourself. You douche. Although he would have said you 
golly. He actually used the word golly the other day, like not as a joke. <laughs> and he's not 90. He's not, I don't know, he's not freaking Gomer Pyle or something. But he used the word golly. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I think that was his purpose okay. behind it. Well, that, that makes a little bit more sense. Cause it because just, it just boggled yeah. my mind. I was just like, I just don't I, get, Why would you put it above the urinal? But now <laughs> I know a little bit more. Okay. Because he's that religious dude. I think the creepy, <laughs> the, the stalkerness of it, the, the peeping Tom nature of this never even occurred to him. He was like, what? Oh, cr oh, that's gross. Why would you think that Santa was looking at your penis? What? Santa's not like that. So yeah, of course everybody else is like, ew, this is gross. Santa's always watching and you put it right here where I pee? Ew. Yeah, so the next day I came in and there was another sign that somebody else had printed out that said Christopher Walken is watching you pee. <laughs> and it's this close-up shot of Christopher Walken's face. I'm not sure what movie it was from, but you know, his eyes are like bugging out, kind of large, and he's got a, the, this weird look on his face with his teeth showing and stuff. So I'm like, all right, well, I think at this point I had already posted the original picture on Facebook, and I'm like, well, I need to update my followers about this new development. So I took a picture of that one and posted it. And but then, it's really the reason Twitter was invented. Not any yeah, exactly. of this, you know, going to the farmer's market. <laughs> look how what this cute top. <laughs> Stuff like that where it's an entertaining story. And also by this time, you know, I'd posted the original picture and somebody else had posted a picture of Jeff Goldblum that said Jeff Goldblum is watching you poop. <laughs> And, and it's, said, oh, it's the most creepy yeah, Jeff Goldblum. It's, like Jeff, it's 1986's The Fly, right, Jeff Goldblum. With the mullet and the, yeah, his eyes are all big. And yeah, so when I saw the Christopher Walken picture show up, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm joining in this fun. And so I printed out that Jeff Goldblum is watching you poop sign. And I put those in the stalls. <laughs> I did two of them and put them in both stalls. And uh, and then, you know, informed the, the folks following the thread and uh, waited to see what happened. Later on that night, both Jeff Goldblum and Christopher Walken had been torn down. I'm assuming this was by the original poster of the picture who was, uh, you know. Not amused. Not amused by this stuff. But Santa remained. Then the next day when I came in, Santa, had, he remained, but somebody had flipped him over. And, you know, I had, when I first saw the Santa, I had a great desire to do some really awful things to it. First of all, I, you know, it's one of those cutesy little pictures where all Santa has for eyes is just dots. But he still had big bushy eyebrows, and I thought it would be fun to add in, you know, big circles around his eyes. But make it so that the dots were right at the bottom, so it looks like he's looking straight down at your wang. I didn't do that. But also, yeah, you know, I thought about, I thought about, you know, you could just write, ew, gross, or something on the picture. I, <laughs> what I really consider, this is the first thing which shows you how freaking disturbed I am. But the first thing that I thought of doing was taking that picture down and then kind of poking a little hole <laughs> where Santa's mouth is. And, and then, you know widening that hole so it was big enough that you could totally pee through it if you wanted to. <laughs> and then even like running it under the faucet so it was wet all around his mouth and then just sticking it right in the urinal. <laughs> so I feel like, yeah, take that Santa, you little bastard. <laughs> but I never did any of that stuff. Somebody else flipped him over. So I think I took a picture of that and posted it. And, uh, and then so Somebody on the thread said that I ought to uh, say something about Krampus. <laughs> and so I made up a little, I got a little cutesy picture of Krampus. And I printed that out with, Krampus is always watching. I wanted to wait because somebody had already, you know, messed with his, his sign and turned it upside down. So I didn't want it to make it seem like... Now, first of all, I wanted him to see that somebody had messed with it before we did any more messing with it. So when I went back in there, the sign was missing from over the urinal. It had been moved to the door. 
and I was waiting at the door as you go to head out. And so I'm like, all right, it's time. And so I put Krampus up over the urinal. It wasn't long before Krampus was gone as well. And then eventually Santa was gone and the whole sordid affair came to an end. But uh, that was a really long and stupid story that probably should be on That Gets My Goat instead of this. Because we haven't even gotten to the stories yet. But I Well, guess... that was a free bonus story for our listeners. <laughs> there you go. And I'm sure they're grateful to hear it. <laughs> I've told the tale, and it's been five or six years now, but of a producer coming to me and saying, you know, we're, we've are we got this contract to do a couple of movies for Hallmark Channel. And would you be interested in writing a Christmas uh, film for it? And uh, it's not one of my great regrets, but I do regret that I didn't give it a try. I, you and I had talked afterward because it just, oh, the, the saccharine-ness yeah, the of Hallmark, that kind of stuff, because... Because it's not genuine emotion, and it's nothing even remotely realistic. It's 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 stuff made for the blandest of people, and your and your grandma, <laughs> and you, my who, dad. Your grandma's not a bland person, <laughs> but everybody else that watches it is. My dad was uh, in the hospital for surgery like last month, and that was one of the only channels he could get in there. And he's like, "Oh, do you get this channel too? You should watch it. It's got some great stuff." really heartwarming yeah I'll, I'll get right on that dad thanks yeah we talked and i said well what about a just in the last episode we talked about that 12 days of christmas gifting uh-huh. kind of thing and i said you know what if it were something uh you know a group of people decided to do this you know anonymous gifting thing but they started to take it too far and and it became like they became obsessed with it and it became almost like rival gangs trying to one up each other or whatever and they're just like no no i've got to find out who that is and it's like no no one can get a better and he's like i've come up with three haikus but none of them are good enough and all that and we're like wow that sounds kind of fun but i think you were the one that told me but that no none of that's gonna fly on hallmark (laughs) channel you're 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 having fun with it and and they, they won't let you have fun with it so basically i told joe no i'm not i'm not interested but in retrospect, I, I wish I had at least, you know, come up with a Pitched paragraph him an or idea something. At least. And just, said, what about this? Just so I could have seen you know, what his reaction would have been. It probably would have made for a better story, too. And I, I vaguely remember my mom watching the one that he produced that, you know, that had been offered that was, you know, locally written and all that. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> it wasn't that as bad uh, and, as you and, thought it would be. I, well, I, mean, I can't remember. It was like it's, it's set in a like a Waldorf Astoria or something like that. And the elevator, what do you call the guy that runs the elevator? Uh, operator? The elevator operator? Well, uh, yeah, maybe there's a name for that. The elevatorist, that. we'll say. But he was like trying to fix everybody's problems and became really involved with, you know... Uh, you know, so-and-so is lonely for the holidays and so-and-so lost her necklace for the holidays and so-and-so is in love with so-and-so and I'm going to play matchmaker and all that stuff. And I was just like, whoa, this sucks, <laughs> man. And You know what I thought at the end of that movie? Oh, you saw it? Yay, white people. That's what I thought. Oh, you oh, best. <laughs> uh, so there's another bonus story for you, folks. Or oh, were you sorry. The, no, that I was more? going to say is maybe we'll make that into a uh, a Hallmark Hall of Fame kind of movie of the uh, the you know the Christmas urinal, <laughs> the urinal war. I mean, that would be hard because the ideas that you come up with are so very not Hallmark Hall of Fame esque. And I think that was what I said when you told me about it. It's just like, oh, yeah, that's good. You got no chance in hell of getting a show on Hallmark Hall of Fame. Although, if I remember right, when we were in screenplay writing, you wrote the most Hallmarky of Hallmark because we had that was one of our assignments was to write a Hallmark, Hallmark commercial. commercial. And you wrote the most Hallmarkiest of Hallmark. The Hallmarky Mark and the Funky Bunch yes. of all the. It was so Hallmarky, and then later you did one that was completely not Hallmarky about like somebody in space that had to get the the card for Job of the Hut, the Emperor of the Galaxy, or something like that. And that one was um, more your style. However, uh, you know, what, do we want to do your story first? How's that sound? 
since we're talking Hallmarky, this this story that you wrote is, I would say, relatively different than your usual style. What do you think of that? Is, am I going out on a lot, limb too much, or am I just not representing you? You got stuff through the whole spectrum. I mean, you do have stuff through the whole I'm spectrum. I'm a United Colors of Benetton kind of writer. Yeah, you do have stuff through the whole spectrum. That's true. Although you're not known so much for your stuff from, you know, you're known more for the stuff in the smaller part of the spectrum. At least by our listeners, I would say. What do you think? Am I smaller? What do you mean? Like a more focused oh, okay. area of the spectrum, not your full spectrum stuff. I mean, people don't know about your historical romances <laughs> as much, <laughs> and uh, your nonfiction work. I, so I guess that means my story is up first. Well, I just thought since we were talking Hallmark. <laughs> Do you remember the professor actually like delivered the lines in like the alien language? Or he's like, yeah. Hallmark, yeah. and Hallmark, I was <laughs> That was so cool. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I guess we should play my story and then we can talk about it afterward. But, uh. Okay, yeah, but all the humor is sucked out of the the room, <laughs> as though you had turned on Mr. Hoover. <laughs> all right, so the story is called "The Holiday Trip," guest starring Captain America and Bucky. It is okay. So that's by Rich Outfield, and all right, thanks for listening, folks. Hope you enjoy the show or the story. Good night, and uh, we'll be back as soon as it's over. The Holiday Trip. Guest starring Captain America and Bucky by Rish Outfield. Dan took off his suit jacket and put it on the hook where the keys hung right beside the door. He went to the living room and before sitting down, flipped the switch that turned the lights on the Christmas tree on. He sat down on the couch, started to loosen his tie, then stared at the flashing patterns on the tree as though hypnotized. Teresa saw him do it. She said her husband's name, and when she got no response, she slipped out of her heels and joined him on the sofa. Dan continued to stare. He was exhausted, and the blinking white lights had a calming, soothing influence on him. She put her arms around him, and he flinched a little, as if he didn't expect her to be there. He pulled his gaze away from the tree. His eyes were red and baggy, and the stubble on his cheeks was more salt and peppery than ever before. You okay? she asked. He nodded, but he honestly didn't know. He felt strange, lost. I sure was glad to have you with me this weekend, he muttered. He took Teresa's hand though it was still cold from the drive. I know we talked about not ever having regrets about getting married when we did. We talked about not voicing those regrets, Danny, she interrupted, squeezing his fingers. Of course we're going to have them from time to time. Everybody does. That sounded reasonable. They'd met and fallen in love considerably later in life than the rest of their friends had and sometimes they wondered if they had missed out on something, not having been together when they were younger and more energetic. They had met with her pushing forty, and him already past it, with all sorts of wasted years before then under their belts. But what was done was done. I know, Dan said, trying to smile, which only made him look more tired but as happy as I was to have a shoulder to cry on. I wish you could have known my dad when he was younger, when he was himself. You said you were never close. He shrugged. No, not really. We just didn't have anything in common. Nothing? He considered. Can't think of anything. For example... He was the toughest man in the world. The kind of dude who never shed a tear. That sure isn't me. Your brother told us Murray cried when Johnny Cash had that last hit song. Dan squinted, 
trying to imagine that happening. Really? When did you say that? While you were getting funeral potatoes. He laughed in spite of himself. God, I can't believe they call them that. Is that a local thing? Not as far as I know. We had funeral potatoes when my grandma died, and I was only eight or nine then. Oh, Dan said, already putting it out of his mind. He leaned back on the sofa. Dad was tough, but not too active. His leg was busted when I was little, and that was it for us running around. Really? I thought that was something recent. But then, several of the pictures that had been set up at the viewing had shown Dan's dad with a cane or walking stick. No, more than thirty years. Maybe forty. He broke it while out hunting in the mountains one fall. Then it never healed right. What happened to the cane? Mom kept it. I think Kyle and Judy wanted to bury him with it. But Mom disagreed. Teresa nodded. She had tried to keep her mouth shut about Dan's family business the entire weekend, especially since her own parents were healthy and happily divorced. Anyway, my dad was a tough old bird, and he probably could have beat me in an arm wrestle even six months ago. Teresa bit back any jokes about his weak forearms and just rubbed his shoulders. Anyway, thanks again for... Dan stopped in mid-sentence, peering at something. Dan? What's that? He gestured to a box sitting under the tree. It was dull and brown, new as far as he could remember. When did you put that there? What? That present? I thought you put it there. He squatted down to get to it, was unable to hold the position, and ended up just plopping himself down on the floor of the little house. Traveling and grieving and pallbearing had tired him out. There's no name, he said. It was a plain brown box with no wrapping paper, slightly larger than a shoebox. Who else has been here? Teresa wondered. Well, Pete said he came over the other night to feed the cat. He must have left it. You think it's for both of us? She asked. Probably. He shook the box. It sounded quite empty. Felt empty, too. Well, let's find out, his wife said, curious. It's, what, a week before Christmas? Three days, she corrected. Three? Dan's mind reeled. Rushing down to Pingo when he heard the news, planning the funeral, meeting with strangers or vague acquaintances, putting the man in the ground, and flying back had eaten up a lot more time than he would have guessed. Teresa watched her husband, trying to determine if he was all right or not. Whether this was a normal reaction or a worrisome one, she didn't know. Go ahead and open it. Take your mind off everything. So Dan broke the seal on the box, which was just a single piece of tape, not proficiently closed at all. He opened up the box, looked inside, and it was... It was empty? I guess this was some kind of joke Pete left, he started to say, and then bright light shone in his eyes. The sun was shining down on Dan from a crisp blue sky, and there was a chill in the air. It was cold. He was outside, and he was... Where was he? He was standing on a dirt road with nothing but farmland leading off into the horizon. To his left, there were snow-covered mountains in the near distance. On his right was a house he remembered remarkably well. His grandparents' house in the little town of Pingo. Of course, that house had been bulldozed years before, and three families now lived in the area that used to be the farm. He knew that for sure, since he had just been there the day before, for Dad's funeral. Plus, the snow that was on the ground now was clean and fresh, 
as opposed to the gray, frozen stuff he'd seen the last couple of days. This was the past. It was... 1949, he heard himself say, though he couldn't possibly have known. That was decades before he was born. And the voice that had spoken, though it had come out of his own throat, was that of a child, like he had sounded at eight or ten years old. Dan looked down at his hands. He wore mittens, strange old-fashioned ones made of ugly gray wool, with a string to tie them together. He had a thick coat on and wranglers instead of dress slacks. However he'd gotten there, he hadn't been out long enough to really feel the cold yet. But he did feel it, on his face and neck. This wasn't his imagination. He walked a few feet toward his grandmother's place, peering up at the huge tree in front of her house. He used to climb up as high as he dared and played on the swing hanging from its largest branch. But the whole thing was half the size he remembered. It only looked huge because... He took off one of the mittens. His hands were tiny. Child's hands. He touched his face, his forehead... The stubble on his chin was gone, and there was hair all the way down to his brow line again. His face felt soft, unlined. A little boy's face. He heard some footsteps approaching in the snow, and saw another little boy come around the side of the house, a big metal circle in his hand. In an instant, he observed two things. One, the circle was the lid to a big grain barrel like Dan had used to feed livestock from, every morning on his own childhood farm. And two, the bushy-haired boy that held the lid, around ten years old and wearing an oversized army jacket, looking at Dan with curiosity, had a somewhat familiar face. His hair was blonde, and he didn't have thick glasses on for the first time ever. But it was his father. He took two more steps toward Dan, Also, he moved without a limp. Hey, Dan said. Hi there, said the kid. Dan glanced up at his grandmother's house. You live here? Uh Uh-huh. Just inside the living room window, he could see the place where he'd watched television in the summers and been read stories by his grandfather. There was a chair sitting there now, but it looked stiff and not very comfortable unlike the lazy boy Grandpa had died in. I remember this place. Yeah? Who are you? My name's Danforth. The other boy scrunched up his face. Really? That's a weird name. I've always thought so, too. Thank you very much. At that, he felt a grin creeping over his face. He couldn't help it. Call me Dan. I'm Murray. Hi, Murray. I... I guess I'm here visiting. He took in his surroundings one more time. Or more likely, this is a dream. A dream? To visit Pingo? Yeah. I used to come here when I was a kid. And it was my dream to come back. It wasn't a great cover. But his dad seemed to buy it. What are you doing? Just playing. Playing what? Captain America. Holy shit, really? Dan exclaimed. But of course, the boy was wearing a sort of uniform, and the lid served as a makeshift shield. My dad sometimes says that word, Murray commented. Captain America, huh? Dan asked. And it's 1949? Murray started blushing. I know, that's all boring war stuff, but I still like the old comics. You do? I find that hard to believe. Dan had liked comic books all his life, and his father had never once mentioned that connection. Murray walked over to him. My dad said he read funny books in France and Germany. Sent me a few. Your dad fighting the war? No, he... He had a bum leg. 
That was exactly how his father would describe it. A bum leg. You want to play? Sure, Dan said, although it had been a long time since he had played anything other than card games or chess. Who are we fighting? The Nazis? Nah, the Japs are tougher than the Krauts. And I saw a bunch of them creeping up through the back field. Must have been a dozen. Dan tried not to laugh. A bunch of Japs. Oh, sure, with swords and rifles. Murray began to stalk through the snow, back the way he came. He moved gracefully, easily. Come on, you can be Bucky, he called to Dan. Dan hesitated. Wow, his father knew who Bucky Barnes was. Dan only knew him from the movies. He hadn't read Cap comics since childhood, but it would be an honor to play him. He ran after. For nearly an hour they played in the yard, in the barn, and in the vast white field behind the house, Dan struggling to keep up with his father, who was tireless, even though his own legs seemed to have more energy than they had in twenty years. They struggled against a battalion of Axis soldiers, dodging pot shots and grenade throws, and even hit the deck when a Japanese Zero strafed toward them, filling the horse pasture with tracer fire. Dan knew this was some kind of dream, but it felt so real. The smell of the farm, the detail of his dad's inelegant leather shoes, even the way his ears were getting half frozen from the cold, and he kept having to wipe snot away from his own reddening nose. How old are you, Murray? He asked during a break in the warfare. Name's Steve, Buck. You know that. Right, but how old are you, Murray? I'll be ten next June. And how old would you say I am? About the same. Am I wrong? I don't suppose you are, Dan said and ran a hand through his newly thick hair. More enemy soldiers were coming in their direction, and the boys took them out in a number of ways, only stopping when Dan made the mistake of suggesting the Japanese military might have sent ninjas after them. Apparently, that word wasn't common knowledge in rural America yet. They like kamikazes? Dan shook his head. More like samurai, you know? Well, they'll fall down just the same. The boy gritted his teeth, which had yet to grow uneven and unhealthy. A couple of them still looked like baby teeth. Despite it being only about 45 degrees out, maybe colder, Dan had worked up quite a sweat. He'd also recovered from an artillery shell and earned at least one medal for valor during their adventure. His father pretended to pin it to Dan's chest. Thanks, Cap, he said, watching his breath as it dissipated a foot in front of his eyes. Uh-oh, look what's coming over that ridge, Buck, Murray exclaimed, pointing to the rough wooden gate between the horse corral and the cow pasture. I can't quite make it out, Cap, Dan admitted. Here, Murray said, handing over a non-existent pair of binoculars. Looks like a medium-sized Imperial tank. That's a Chi Nu. Okay, Dan replied, having no idea what they were looking at. It's our job to take it out, son, Murray said. Think you're up to it? Dan grinned at being called son. He saluted. Ready when you are, Cap. The situation looked pretty dire there for a moment, but the duo managed to get around the big tank and take out its treads with a pair of discarded Tommy guns, which looked suspiciously to Dan like tree branches. The enemy advance was thwarted, and the day was saved. The boys cheered. Race you back to the house, Murray announced, and took off like a shot. Dan didn't have a chance of keeping up, but he did try. They made it to the back porch, which looked totally different than it had in Dan's childhood, hunched over and gasping for air. Hey, Murray, Dan said after a while. You still have those old comics your dad sent you? The Captain America ones? Yeah, they're in a big crate my dad keeps in the shed. You really need to save those. They'll be worth lots of money when you're older. Murray sneered. Old funny books? Come on. 
I mean it. They'll even make movies about Captain America one day. Murray squinted at him. And Bucky, too? Yes, actually, he chuckled. He wondered if the old man had ever seen any of the Chris Evans movies. It didn't seem likely, but then none of this did. Murray's gaze moved to the front of the house, then back to Dan. Guess it's time for you to go, he said. What do you mean? He pointed. There was a woman standing at the end of the gravel driveway, waiting patiently. It was Teresa, dressed in the coat and gray dress she'd worn to the funeral. Is that your mom? Murray asked. No, it's actually my... And Dan shrugged. His throat suddenly had something golf ball-sized stuck in it. Well, it sure was good playing war with you, man. Yep. Come over whenever you want. Don't got a lot of friends. That would be nice. His father smirked. All right, Dan Forth. You keep an eye out for them Japs. Dan barked out a laugh. You too. And then he walked past his grandmother's house to rejoin his wife, wherever she was going. At the last minute, he thought to look back, to see if maybe he could spy. And then Dan realized he was indoors again, back in his living room, sitting on the floor, still wearing the tie and suit pants from the funeral. Empty? Teresa said from the couch. He craned his neck to look at his wife, then around the room. Did you? Finally, he looked down at his hands. Big, hairy, wedding ring. No antique mittens. Did you just experience that? What? Deja vu? Yeah, a little bit. I don't know why. No, I... I was on the farm, with my dad, for just a couple of minutes. I'd swear it. Only I was a little boy, too, for some reason. And you were there. She got down on the floor next to him. When was this? A dream you had? No, it was real. I... But of course, it made no frigging sense, now that he was back and out of the dream. Especially that they would both be nine-year-old boys at the same time, or that his dad would play with him so willingly if they had just met each other. Still, it had seemed so real. He could still remember the smell of that birch tree from the front of his grandparents' yard. He put his hands over his ears, touched his nose. Nothing frozen or even cold. He touched the top of his head. Most of his hair was gone. Dan, I thought you said it was empty, Teresa said. She held up the mystery box. He looked over. Huh? She showed him. At the bottom of the box were a half dozen ancient Captain America comics. The top one was from 1945, with Cap and Bucky beating up some men attempting to blow up the U.S. gasoline reserve on the cover. His dad's name was written on the top left corner of each one. The End All right. So there you go. That was a wacky, zany trip into uh, another universe, right? Go do grable Hallmark. And then at the end it said, Hallmark, when you have to melt the toughest hearts. <laughs> Instead of when you care enough to send the... Wait, was that what t- Hallmark's old? When you care enough to send, to send the, the very, very best? best? I think so. I think that was their thing. So yeah, I changed that to when you have to melt the toughest hearts. This one was a heart-melting kind of a story, right? It was a heart-warming, maybe. What do you think? I don't know. I'm too close to it. How close Plus, are you? we wrote it so recently uh-huh. that we haven't had any time for perspective, right? I right. mean, usually the, the, the best thing to do is to write something and then set it down and write something else and then come back to it just so you have fresher eyes. 
So you don't know immediately what you were trying to say, and you can see what you actually did say, and change it if it if it doesn't line up. Yeah, that's true. But in this case, we just couldn't do it. We had no time. We had to get it out before Christmas, and uh, we didn't even have time to get together to record them. We just had to do them separately, which is not optimal. Uh, I had in my mind, you know, sort of divvied out the parts of who you would be and who I would be, and we couldn't do that, so... But I think it's cool. It gives people an idea of what you are like as a narrator, which, you know, we don't get. And by narrator, I mean, like, you know, uh, the stuff you do for Audible and things like that, which we don't do so much here because we like to get somebody for all the parts and stuff, which I guess we're kind of transitioning away from, too. So, Well, yeah, it just it takes three times longer, four times longer to do that sort of stuff. And most of it is just getting somebody to do s silly little, you know, one line here, one line there kind of a thing. If we just get together and do it together, that doesn't take any extra time, aside from finally getting our schedules matched so that we can do that. So we got to hear uh, Rish's little boy voice, we got to hear Rish's old man voice, and Rish's female voice. Good times. All right. <laughs> But yes, uh, originally this was called The Holiday Visit, and I hated that title. I still do. <laughs> but I just couldn't come up with anything else, and then I thought, well, maybe The Holiday Trip, like drug trip. Yeah, acid <laughs> trip. So I, I made up a mock-up of the cover of that said The Holiday Trip, and then just for fun, I put guest starring Captain America and Bucky. And that's what I ended up going with as the title of the story. But... I sent it to Marshall and said, hey, is this a cool title? And he said, well, yeah, it sounds good. If Captain America and <laughs> Bucky actually appear in the story. I mean, so now, yeah, I, I, I wonder. No, I think it's good the way that they do appear. As long as they do actually appear, which they did. Okay. Two kids pretending to be them is cool. You know, it's like that story we did way back when called Tupac Shakur and the <laughs> End of the End World. Of the world yes. You know, it works because the, the woman had to write the book about Tupac Shakur's life. And she also, you know, they wound up going to the place where his statue, statue was in, in Georgia. It made sense. Like my David Bowie story. You know, David Bowie didn't really appear. But in a way, he did. But, you know, if, the, if there was nothing to do with Captain America and Bucky whatsoever in the entire story, I think people would be pissed. They'd be like, what the? I, I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to it, because I didn't get the Captain America thing. <laughs> I don't, I'm confused. It's just thrown in there to be a weird title, you mean? or just? I know some writers really like odd titles, and it seems like people go with the odd title a lot for short stories as opposed to novels. You know, you'll get uh, Jason Sanford doing a story like When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees... Yeah, you know, you'll get the, the more unusual titles often with a book like that, but when it, or with a short story like that, sorry, but when it comes to making a book, I think uh, that's when editor says, uh, okay, when thorns are tips of trees is good, but I like it a lot better if it was just called thorns. And that's what the book would wind up being called. Which we have to have told that story. On yes, the show before, yes, we've right? told it multiple times. I would think, just because <laughs> it's endlessly funny to do that voice and change your titles. <laughs> so, why did you write this story, Rish? What gave you the idea? Well, we had a broken mirror prompt. No one knew <laughs> okay. where the present came from. There was nothing written on the box. Well, it could have been the Elf tour of New York City inside the box, but you went with a magical journey into 1949 to see an old man's father and find out the one thing that they had in common turning out to be love for comics and Captain America and Bucky. <laughs> I don't know if that works. I mean, I certainly love comics. But yeah, just finding out that you have something in common with your old man. I mean, that's that was the premise, the original idea that Bob Zemeckis had for Back to the Future is if I went back in time to when my dad was my age, would we be friends? Would we get along? Would we have anything in common? And there's that moment, you know, where George says the exact same thing that Marty said at the beginning about his audition, and you realize, well, they're more alike than you ever would have guessed. And 
and I don't know. I mean, this is just a fictional little holiday story, but just trying to imagine what my father and I would have in common. Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you've talked on the show before. You and your dad get along. You have the wonderful impression of his voice that you uh, always do. Anytime it's like a stern <laughs> disciplinarian or something, I, that's the voice I go with. But, you know, sometimes you find things out that you are more alike than you realize. And, you know, sometimes you and I spend time together and you have met my father on a couple of occasions. When I close off my mind and think that there's no other possible opinion that's valid, or when uh, suddenly I have a tremendous amount of self-righteousness of my way or the highway, that, that that's my dad coming through. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a negative where we have <laughs> You guys have the common. same faults. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in many ways, I think we do. But yeah, I just, I, I don't know. That, I... Do you look a lot like your dad? A little bit, yeah. I mean, not... My dad's bald, so it's hard to see the resemblance, you know what I mean? Hmm. And my dad's been bald since freaking day one, I swear. <laughs> you look back at his pictures when he was in, like, college, and he's already got a really high forehead, and uh, it wasn't long after that before he was already bald. And uh, so it's a lot harder to see the uh, similarities between me and my dad, but every now and then I'll see a picture of him. One that's more candid, especially, usually, you know, one that's less a posed picture. And I'll be like, holy crap, he looks exactly like me in that picture. Wow. Yeah, there's one where it was my dad's side of the family. They'd all gotten together for like a little dinner, family dinner, and they had a picture of them all standing there. He had like a little bit of facial hair going, which was also not a thing that my dad did. He was always clean shaven. And yeah, when I saw the picture, I'm like, holy crap! With that, like, little bit of goatee and stuff going, he looks exactly like me. And he still had hair, so... Yeah, <laughs> it looked a lot more similar. The greatest thing ever, though, is uh, when I stumbled across this one picture of him from, like, mid-1970s, where he had this huge mustache that came out and curled at the ends with the freaking wax and everything. And I went, holy crap! What is this? My dad always worked with, like, the National Guard and stuff like that. And I think he just... He wasn't... Once it got beyond a certain point and he started doing, you know, the curling of it and all that stuff, they said, no, I'm sorry, it's too... But you have to shave. You can't have a, a mustache like that. And uh, when... And I guess when they told him that, he's like, well, pfft. What other reason would I have a mustache for? And so he shaved it off and never went back. Anyway, sorry, that's beside the point. You were, I think, about to say something before I asked you if you looked like your dad. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's going back along the lines of, of just having almost no time to write these things. I think, you know, I mean, in the future, maybe I'll go back and look and see if I can build up Dan's feelings that he and his dad never connected in any way. They didn't have anything in common just so that he gets that. He gets his Christmas wish... Uh, at the end. And yeah, originally, the wife also got to be young and play with them. Just, you know, when I was coming up with the idea, she was going to play as well. And I don't know if it would have been stronger to have the three, but ultimately I just cut that and had her appear when it was time to go back as a reminder of the, the life he, where he actually belonged. But I don't know. the The story wasn't about the husband and wife bonding with the the father, the father-in-law. It was about the son getting to bond with his dad, which he had, had missed out on. Uh-huh. So it just felt like having the wife there might dilute that. or Muddy things up I, a little bit. I don't know. And, and again, I'm not sure that, that I made the right decision, but that's the decision I made. On this story, I asked the the Facebook people to give me the names of the characters and they were the ones that came up with Murray and Dan and, and started with a W went, what was the wife's name? Wotan? Yikes. <laughs> yeah, those those Facebook friends. <laughs> Did they Wotan. come up with Dan Forth or just Dan? Somebody said Dan for the dad and I ended up using it for the son just for that one moment of for that Back to the Future-esque thing so that you should have had him say, hmm, 
Danforth is a nice name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we should name our third kid that. That's weird. <laughs> Just for the line where the dad actually thinks that that's a stupid name, too. Even though he's the one that gave it to him. Yeah, eventually, everybody's going to kind of have that. I mean, you've... And a lot of people have it in both ends. I mean, you don't have any kids that you know of. Thank you. But, but eventually, you see it from the other side, too. You know, you have your dad, and there's a generation gap where you have a hard time connecting and then you have kids and that gap comes again and i don't know if if i hung out with my son if i was his age if he would be like yeah this guy's cool i want to hang out with him or not i don't know i guess it's easier to go in the opposite direction because you can sort of have a knowledge of the past but when you're an old person and then you like try and hang out with the young kids, you don't know to say like, oh, that movie was lit. This video game, I love it. I, I, I always play this game. I, I'm really good at, oh crap, I died again. Because yeah, I mean, that's what my friend, son does with his friends all the time. And I try, you know, because I think my wife is just like, oh, he's just been playing video games all day long. And I try to put myself in his place sometimes. Because I, I think I did my share of that. The video games were not as awesome. I mean, we played S Space Quest and... Uh, you, you would always talk about Trade Wars. Trade Wars was, yeah, a, a game back in the days when it was pre-internet. But it was still a community kind of a thing where you would call up the BBS, which I believe stands for Bulletin Board System. One person could be on at a time, but they had games where, you know, you had to turn a day. And, yeah, Trade Wars was one of those where you'd get on and you would trade stuff back and forth to get money. And then you could buy fighters and you could go and attack other people's ships and stuff with it. And <laughs> why, but I liked that game a lot. Stuff like that. I played those kind of things all the time. And so I, I often tried to defend my son and be like, no, just because he plays video games all day long doesn't mean that he's... Well, maybe it does mean that he's going to be an idiot when he grows up, because I'm comparing him to myself. But yeah, I don't know. I wonder if I could just hang out with my son, because there is that generation gap. But for a long time, kids aren't at your level, you know? You can play horsey with them or whatever, and anybody can do that and entertain a kid. But once you get a little older, and now my kids are finally getting to the age where like I could sit down and have a conversation with them. But do we have anything to talk about? That's the problem. I, don't, I feel sometimes like I'm that disciplinarian. It's just like, you gotta do your homework and you gotta do your chores. And someday he's gonna move away and he's gonna be like, I don't wanna go visit dad. It just make me take out the garbage. Cause I guess the majority of the kid's life is not really spent at your house. You know, the first 18, 20 years or so, and then they move on and have their own life, and they live for another 60 years or more beyond that. Can you relate to them once that happens? Is a, It's an interesting thing that I'm about to embark on, I suppose. As my kids get a little bit older and start doing that, it's tough. Yeah, your story made me think a lot, I guess. Well, that's good. I don't know. We talked before about whether people would like our stories or not, and... Uh... Jury's still out, I guess, but hopefully they, they get something out of it. Yeah. Speaking of stories that aren't going to make you think, maybe we should move on to mine? Okay. What is your story called? The Christmas Gift. It's called A Christmas Wish. Whoops. <laughs> a Christmas Wish. Close, okay. but not quite. Just like mine was holiday trip and I said Christmas. I don't know if that's a good title. I, I thought about coming up with something else, but I didn't want to tip my cards and gives too much away. It's not a title that's going to make you think, oh, I need to read that. Maybe I should call it A Christmas Wish, co-starring Yukon Cornelius, Rudolph, and all the toys from the Lost Island of Toys. What is it called? The Island of Misfit Toys. Uh, Misfit Toys, there we go. Anyways, it's not a cool title. That's uh, always one of my uh, problems with writing, is coming up with a good title. This time... Didn't have it. Sorry. But hopefully you like the story. We'll go ahead and play it now, and uh, we'll talk to you some more on the other end. 
A Christmas Wish by B. D. Anklevich. Eddie's grandma was a witch. The kids started teasing him about it when he was in second grade. At first, he denied it because they'd said it like it was a terrible thing. But eventually, he'd learned it was true. Vovó had grown up in the interior of Bahia, Brazil, steeped in macumba, the local witchcraft that had come across the Atlantic on slave ships hundreds of years ago. The funny thing was that many of the kids who called Vovó a witch had parents who visited her regularly in search of spells to help with things like a job interview or getting money for an anniversary present. People might call her a witch, but around here, she was also a respected member of the community, too. His mother, Vitoria, didn't go in much for the traditions Vovó had brought over from Brazil. The United States was her home, and she wanted to follow their traditions instead. So she told Eddie nothing of what they were, or how they worked. This Christmas, though, Eddie was determined to find out, and take advantage of them. Vovó lived in their basement, an arrangement that Eddie's dad, Richard, endlessly complained about. Whenever Vovó wasn't around to hear, anyway. So despite that Eddie was still 15, unable to drive and basically a prisoner in his own home, it wasn't hard to see his grandma. He went down to her room one November day after school and told her about Isabella Lopez. She was the world's most beautiful girl. She was in his history class, his biology class, and his Spanish class. And he had the biggest crush on her. Was there any way the vovó's particular talents could help him? Ai, meu Deus do céu, menino! Como pode me pedir isso? I'm, I'm sorry, vovó, I don't know what you said, Eddie replied. It didn't sound good. It sounded more like she was mad at him for something. I said, well, never mind what I said. Listen to what I'm saying now. I cannot do this for you, Edivaldo. This is one thing that I never touch. I don't do love potions. It's not right to try to toy with people's emotions. I'm sorry, Minyano, but you gotta earn her love for yourself. <clears throat> no, no, I'm, I'm fine with that, Vovó, Eddie said. I don't want you to force her to love me or anything like that. I don't want a love slave or whatever. Although, now that you mention it, no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Vovó, it, it was a joke. No, I... I just was hoping that you might maybe just give me a little help, a little suggestion or something, uh, I don't know, just like a nudge, you know? I'm sorry, Minino. The answer is no, said Vovó. So, Eddie just waited a few weeks for an opportunity. At last, Vovó and Mom went to the market together, and Eddie went snooping in her books. He had seen plenty of movies on European-style witches with cauldrons and black cats, toads and eyes of newt. But Brazilian macumba was nothing like that. It was much more about dance and song. He'd looked it up on Wikipedia, hoping for some kind of instructions, and it had said that it was mostly an oral tradition, and only recently had anyone tried writing any of it down. Eddie was hoping, beyond hope, that his vovó felt the need to get her hands on some of those books. Who knows, maybe just for old time's sake. He felt like a thug going through vovó's stuff while she was away like that. He was very careful to make sure that he put everything back exactly where he found it. Except for the spell book. He was pretty sure it was the spell book anyway. It looked like one. His Portuguese was shit, but... He thought he could understand enough to see that he had the right book. Google would have to help him with the rest. He stuffed the book into his waistband and hurried back upstairs to safety. Certain that he was making a fool of himself, Eddie danced, sang, and made an offering of a silver ring his parents had given him years ago that was now too small for his finger. A bow from the Christmas tree downstairs and some of the sausage picked out of last night's black beans. This was supposed to make his Christmas wish come true. 
using the charcoal left from his offering. He wrote Isabella's name on the back of a picture of her he'd printed out for the occasion. He'd taken it clandestinely with his iPhone, put it in a box, and wrapped it with festive paper. The air was crisp and cold as he walked down the block and around the corner to put the box on her porch and run away before she saw him. Izzy was in the family room watching TV when the doorbell rang. Jeanette was the only other one home, and she was in a room watching anime on her phone. She probably didn't even hear the doorbell through her headphones. Looked like Izzy was going to have to pause the fucking voice and go answer the door. She didn't want to. That hot Billy Gilman was about to sing. She could pause and come back, though. She was pissed when she opened the door and no one was there. She'd left Billy for a doorbell ditcher? Damn it. Then she saw the box on the porch. Oops. Some kind of Christmas thing. Probably for Jeanette. Boys were always sniffing around after Jeanette. You get so many advantages in life when you've got big jugs. Izzy wished she had a set of those herself. She picked the box up off the porch, turned it over in her hands. No name was written on the box anywhere. It was wrapped in Christmas paper, but weirdly, it was wrapped like they do on TV commercials, where the lid is wrapped separately from the base, and you can just lift the lid right off. So she did. The porch light shone into the depths of the box, revealing a small piece of paper. She pulled it out and saw that it was a picture of herself. She didn't recognize it. It looked like a picture of her at school. She didn't get time to place exactly where it might have been taken, however, because it suddenly started burning in her hands. She yelped and dropped it. It burned itself away completely before even making it to the ground. How had that happened? That was really weird. She looked into the box again. There was nothing left inside. Really weird. She looked around the dark street, wondering if she might catch someone watching secretly in the darkness. If anyone was there, they were hidden well enough that Izzy couldn't see them. God, that was creepy, she said out loud, and backed into the house, closing the door behind her. She was unsettled. That had been a picture of her. One some creeper had taken of her without her knowledge, and then it had burned in her hand without any match or anything to light it. She wasn't sure that she could enjoy going back to what Billy Gilman sing after all. Too strangely uneasy. But she'd give it a try anyway. Eddie stood up from his hiding place behind the bushes in the neighbor's yard. He'd had absolutely no idea what to expect, but he couldn't complain. That was real witchcraft. He hadn't rigged anything up to cause that fire. He'd put a clean, undoctored photo in the box, and it had spontaneously combusted. That's weird, right? That's good, right? He still had no idea what was coming next. He'd simply wished for something that would make Isabella Lopez like him. How might that come to pass? Eddie caught a whiff of something fetid wafting on the breeze. Then he heard a noise coming from the yard of the neighbor on the other side. He wandered over to the right to see if he could get a good look at what was making it. He almost soiled himself when he saw what it was. Standing outside a window on the side of the house, prying the frame upward, was a gigantic, shaggy, white... Uh, monster. He could only call it a monster. It looked like an abdominal snowman. A, a, uh, a yeti. Holy shit, what had he done? Eddie stood there stunned as the Yeti pulled the window open and reached its huge, ape-like arms inside. It fished around for a moment, then drew a screaming girl out by her ankle. It wasn't Isabella, though. This girl had bleached blonde hair dangling from her upended head. Isabella had hair that was a sort of reddish-black. It must be her sister, or whatever her name was. Eddie had to do something. This was his doing, after all. He couldn't just let this creature eat Isabella's sister. He looked around for a rock he could throw. Maybe he could distract the thing away from the girl and get it to come after him. Although he'd probably just miss, he'd never been good at sports. He grabbed a rock out of the flower bed and wound up to throw it. What had his dad said about throwing? Keep your eye on the ball? No, that was batting. Crap. 
He launched the rock, praying his aim would be true. He didn't have time to think any further. Ow! Screamed the girl as Eddie's rock glanced off her posterior. Shit. <sighs> Some help he was. Should he try again? He looked for another rock. The Yeti lifted the girl high in the air and squinted at her face. Then it sniffed her, putting its face right against her body. She squealed with unease as its monstrous snout snuffled up and down her frame. Then the Yeti thrust her away with a growl. It reached up the other arm, lifting her body up until she was supine, then began stuffing her back through the window. What's going on out here? A female voice asked from the porch. Eddie and the Yeti both looked to see what this new wrinkle was. Eddie's eyes bulged in alarm, and the Yeti's eyes narrowed. It dropped the sister the rest of the way through the window with a thump and strode purposefully toward Isabella, who had appeared at the front door. Eddie grabbed another rock and flung it wildly. It clattered harmlessly off the house as the Yeti grabbed Isabella around the waist and yanked her up under one arm, then turned and strode off down the dark street. Oh, shit. What could he do now? The goddamn Yeti that he had somehow summoned was going to carry the girl he was hoping might become his girlfriend off to its... lair? And, and eat her at its leisure. And he was so far from the kind of tough guy that could turn this situation around that it would be comical if it weren't for the lethal nature of the whole affair. He started to run after Isabella and the Yeti and immediately tripped on a rake in the flower bed and fell on his face hard. He saw stars for a moment, groaned, and forced himself back to his feet. Maybe he could use the rake. He had a much better chance to actually connect with the creature that way than with his poorly aimed rock throws. He snatched it up and dashed after the beast, thinking as he ran that next time he would listen to his vovo when she told him not to mess with magic. He caught up with the monster and its captive a few houses down the street. He ran at his top speed with the rake on his shoulder poised to strike. With all the adrenaline coursing through his system, he was willing to bet that no Olympic sprinter could top him right now, inability with sports or not. He crashed the rake down onto the Yeti's back with all his might, bellowing a battle cry as he struck. The rake rattled in his hands and then snapped into two pieces. Eddie fell to the ground, skinning his elbow on the asphalt as he rolled past the beast. Eddie? he heard Isabella say. Eddie! Help! Help me! The Yeti grunted an angry sound and reached up over its shoulder with the arm not holding the girl. It grabbed the rake head, which was sticking out of its back. The ten prongs sunk into its flesh and yanked it free. It growled again and tossed the busted half of a rake aside. It turned to look at Eddie and glowered. Eddie slid backwards on the street and lifted the broken rake handle in a protective gesture. What had he done? He may well have conjured both his own death and Isabella's as well. Who would the Yeti eat first? How awful would the next minutes or hours before it finally ended and the monster killed them both be? Help me, Eddie, please, Isabella screamed. He had to. Even if he wasn't responsible for all this, he would have to. He dragged himself to his feet and advanced on the monster, holding the broken rake handle like a spear. He jabbed it at the creature's chest, but it swatted his attack away with a seemingly casual wave of its hand. Eddie jabbed again, and that's when Eddie realized he'd been far too cavalier and not nearly calculating enough with his attack. The monster's arms were much longer than what he had left of the rake handle. When Eddie jabbed, the Yeti reached out, again with apparent unconcern, and swatted Eddie upside the head. The world went black, and Eddie collapsed to the ground like a puppet whose strings had been cut. He came to a few moments later, and immediately regretted it. The world was swaying madly, and his stomach was objecting mightily to the present state of things. His head was pounding, and the thick stench of the creature who was now carrying Eddie under its other arm smelled like a pile of rotting carcasses marinating in sewage. He longed for the sweet oblivion he'd just swam his way out of. Wouldn't it have been much nicer to be consumed as a yeti snack while he was knocked out? 
so he wouldn't have to feel the pain of his own death? He groaned miserably. Ugh. Eddie, are you awake? Are you okay? asked Isabella. He groaned again. Everything hurt too much to answer. Eddie? she pleaded again. Isabella, yeah, I'm awake. My head hurts, but I think I'm okay. What's going on? Eddie asked. Isabella's voice grew alternatingly quiet and loud as she swung back and forth with each stride of the monster. I think it's taking us somewhere. We're not in the neighborhood anymore. It's taking us out into the woods now. What do you think it's doing? What does it want? To eat us? Eddie asked. I don't know. I hope not. What can we do? We've got to get away. Okay, Eddie said. Um, let's see what we can do. As Eddie swung past the creature's body the next time, he slammed his fist into its side as hard as he could. His fist screamed with pain. It felt like he'd punched a brick wall. Was the thing made of steel? He shook his hand out, moaning. He had to try something else. Maybe there was a soft spot on the thing somewhere. Did it have a nutsack he could punch? Eddie assumed it would be in the regular place. On his next swing past, Eddie lashed out at the creature's crotch. Again, his fist screamed with pain, but this time the creature seemed to notice the attack at least, because it stopped its endless striding and dropped both Eddie and Isabella on the ground at the base of a tree. Eddie and Isabella immediately jumped to their feet and tried to flee, but the creature was prepared. It simply grabbed them by their waist and pushed them back down to the seated position that they'd tried to flee from. Isabella tried to get up and run again, but didn't even get her backside more than two inches off the ground before the monster shoved her back down again. It looked at them both and roared menacingly, then watched them, as if it were daring them to try to run again. Isabella whimpered, and the creature barked one more growl, then turned away, looking up into the tree branches above them. Oh God, Eddie, is this it? She turned to him and grabbed his hand in hers. There was a time just a few hours ago that Eddie would have found this to be the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to him. But sitting beneath the shaggy, rank fur of an angry yeti was just not the place for this to be a positive experience. Get ready to run, Eddie said. He had no idea how they could make it work this time, but he felt like Finn in that Star Wars movie, only this time Ray actually wanted to hold his hand, wanted his help. He had to do something. Besides, the only reason they were staring down the barrel of a tooth-filled maw was because of his idiotic attempt to cast a magic spell that he understood nothing about. Why hadn't he just tried working out or getting a Mustang like normal boys do to get the girl? The creature seemed distracted now. It was reaching up into the bare branches of the tree and grabbing at something. Maybe it was going to snap a branch off to beat them with. That seemed like a stupid thought to Eddie, but he couldn't help it. His mind wouldn't stop providing him with new and worse doomsday scenarios. Ready? He said to Isabella. While it's distracted. He squeezed his hand down tightly on hers. Now, he said, and jumped to his feet. Isabella jumped too, and they started to run, but before they even got a foot away, the Yeti's huge hand grabbed him and slammed him back down in his previous seated position. Isabella followed him back down a fraction of a second later, and the Yeti was no longer distracted. It roared at the two of them, as loud as they'd heard yet, then glared at them intently. Eddie was shaking, but Isabella seemed past that point, as though she'd accepted the inevitable, and just wanted the creature to get on with it. The Yeti reached out with its right arm and shoved Eddie by the shoulder toward Isabella, he banged into her, bashing his cheek hard against her forehead. He grunted in pain, and the Yeti roared again. Then, still using its right arm, it awkwardly pushed Isabella toward Eddie. She was shorter than Eddie, and also on a downward slope from him, so her forehead banged into his breastbone this time. Was this its plan, to bash the two of them together until they were nothing but pulp? Was this what it was like to be a mouse under the sway of a cat? as it was toyed with before the killing claw tore its insides out. Another shove, a little softer this time, pushed Eddie toward Isabella, and the creature let out a snuffle to go with it. The thing's face looked, what, expectant? 
Could a monster like this look expectant? What did it want? Suddenly, Isabella let out a giggle from her seat next to him. <laughs> he looked at her, assuming her eyes would be glazed with madness, but she was just softly shaking her head. What? But Eddie's mind was balking. He couldn't get anything more than that out. Look, Isabella said, and pointed up at the Yeti's left arm. It was poised above their two heads, and it had some sort of plant in its dirty fist. The creature snuffled again, bouncing its head up and down, and then it let out a sound that remarkably resembled the whine of a dog, wanting you to toss it that treat you've been tantalizing it with. What? Again, Eddie couldn't get the question all the way out. Something really weird was going on here. He thought he'd understood what was happening, but things seemed to have pivoted 90 degrees and he couldn't keep up. That's mistletoe. I think this thing wants us to kiss. <laughs> she chuckled again and shook her head with a smile. What? said Eddie incredulously. It... What? The creature bounced up and down, snuffled, and let out a growling noise that could be described as nothing else but excited. Eddie looked at Isabella, who raised her eyebrows in a what-else-can-we-do expression. Then he looked at the monster, who seemed to have had enough of the waiting. It reared back and roared twice as loud as any other time so far. Eddie could feel his bones vibrating from the force of its rumble. He turned to Isabella and leaned in to peck her on the lips. As he started to pull away, the creature growled again menacingly. So he stopped pulling away and kissed her again, doing his best to do it with feeling. He brought his hand to her cheek, and she did the same to him. If he weren't under the watchful eye of a dangerous monster at the time, this could possibly be the best day of his entire life so far. A big breeze rose up as they kissed, and Eddie opened his eyes, keeping his lips fastened on Isabella's. Her eyes remained closed. She almost looked as though she might be enjoying this. Without moving his head, Eddie glanced to the left to see if the beast looked satisfied. But he couldn't see it at all. He broke off his kiss and looked around wildly. Where could it be? The only thing he saw was what looked like a wisp of white fog swirling away on the breeze that had just rustled past them a moment before. It's gone, Eddie said laughing. <laughs> it's gone! Yeah, said Isabella with an exhale. I guess so. Oh, man, I thought we were going to die there. I can't believe it. What, what do you think that thing was, Isabella? A, a yeti or something? Call me Izzy, she said, and I have no idea. I, I just don't know. Well, I suppose I better get you home, Isabel, uh, Izzy. Sure, she said, and grabbed his hand as they started the short walk back from the woods. Hello? Vovo? Are you down here? Eddie asked into the darkness. I'm back here, Eddie, in the kitchen. It wasn't much of a kitchen down in Vovo's basement apartment. Just a sink and a stove. Oh, oh, and a microwave. Up against one wall, but she liked to call it that anyhow. Before she'd moved in with them, that had been where Dad's unused exercise machine stood. Eddie slunk into the room and sat next to Vovo at the tiny table in the only other chair there. What's going on with you, Edgivaldo? You look like the dog that just got yelled at for stealing food off the table. I've got to say I'm sorry to you, Vovo. I screwed up. I did something bad. Something that I shouldn't have done. And I'm sorry. Oh, said Vovo, looking surprised and confused. What did you do? Eddie told her the entire story, leaving nothing out, telling her of how he'd stolen the spell out of her book and what the disastrous consequences turned out to be. I'm really sorry, Vol. I know I shouldn't have done that, and I never will again. I've, I've learned my lesson. Well, okay, Edivaldo. I'm glad you're going to stay out of my stuff, but... But? But what, Vovo? But uh, I don't think any of that was your fault. What do you mean? 
Of course it was my fault, Hetty said. When I told you that love potions were bad and that I wouldn't touch them, I was just playing with you. There's no such thing. That's just stuff of movies and books. My magic doesn't work that way at all. That book you looked at was garbage. I got that a while back from a friend who thought I might like it, but there's nothing in it that works. It's garbage. It's all made up to fool silly white people into buying something about voodoo magic. It wasn't you who made that happen. I mean, did you really think that Brazilian Macumba could conjure up an abominable snowman? It doesn't snow enough in Brazil to even make Frosty the snowman. What? It wasn't me? Then how? How? I don't know. Maybe you better ask that girl, Isabella. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. And we're back. Thank you for listening to that story. What is it you always say? Hope you enjoyed the story. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. After the story, the feedback. After the story, the feedback. What's the feedback on this story, Rishi Outfield? I want you to do an escape pod version of the feedback. Okay. Oh, I so knew that the abominable snowman was going to show up. It was so predictable. So predictable. I knew it. So I might as well have just put abominable snowman in the title. The Christmas Wish. <laughs> Co-starring the abominable, the abominable snowman. snowman. No, I had no clue that this abominable snowman was coming. And anyone who says otherwise is lying. <laughs> the Portuguese thing was new. I, I can't remember having come across that in any of your writing before. Yeah. I've been reading enough Orson Scott Card that... Uh... Yeah, it comes up again and again and again in his stuff. It's all he ever does. It's all Portuguese, Brazilian, this, that. But yeah, I rarely hear you speak Portuguese, so to hear it on this is, was a rare treat. <laughs> Except for that any time that you do hear me, you like cringe and go, ah, oh, it's so ugly. It, it is an ugly language to my <laughs> ears because it just, I, I understand what you're saying, but it just doesn't sound right. Because it yeah. sounds close to Spanish, but not close enough. You know, in that Arrival movie, she's a linguist and she starts off the class that is interrupted by the arrival of the aliens with, today we're going to talk about Portuguese and why well, it's it sounds different totally different than, different than, all than the all other the romance other. Yeah, languages. and I was just like, what? Now that I understand what she's trying to it, say there. Yeah, she says, it all starts in a, a city called Galicia, and that's all we hear. Yeah, you know, I heard one time somebody talking about Spanish, and you know how, like, in, in Spanish from Spain, they have that kind of lith? Yes, the they Barcelona. Yeah, Barcelona. The theta is what they call it. Yeah, apparently that comes from like everybody imitating uh, like really popular or great or I can't remember exactly what the why they wanted to imitate this guy. Maybe he was the king or he was rich or whatever the deal was, but he had a lisp and so everybody just copied him and pretty soon that became the accent for the whole damn country. Interesting. <laughs> it's a valid dialect, I understand, but I can't help but cringe <laughs> when I hear that, too. And sometimes there will be actors from Spain who are playing Colombians or Mexicans or whatever, and you hear them do it. I'm not fluent anymore. My Spanish is mostly atrophied, like you wouldn't believe, but I still ever, you know, I can't help but notice that when they do the, the theta. Yeah. I mean, maybe I should ask you, do you get to keep up with Portuguese at all? Not really, no. I, uh, the weird thing is I know a few people who speak Portuguese and I never speak it with them. I totally could if I wanted to, but I just don't and it's dumb. Um, well, see, but what am I going to do with it? You know what I mean? Like, Well, right. Yeah. I mean, you go anywhere in California and you get a chance to practice Spanish. I get to practice Spanish here from time to time. And when I was growing up, I could speak Spanish to my mom when I didn't want my brother or sisters to understand what we were saying because none of them spoke it but now yeah I just it's it's too frustrating i can <laughs> i mean going back to arrival when you immerse yourself in a language or you know you say it, you use it enough you start to think in that language and, yeah. and in the movie you start to dream yeah in that he, language. she's having a dream yeah. where the guy asks her if she's dreaming in the language she goes no and like the little symbols or whatever are appearing. I can't remember exactly how that went. But yeah, that does happen. I think, and I don't know, but I, you know, I haven't been to Mexico in years. In 
gosh, it'll be 20 years next year. Oh, no, that's not true. We used to go surfing. I almost drowned in Mexico. Oh, nice. But I think it would just take a day or so immersed in that before my... What do you call those parts of your the brain? Vestigial, uh, before the vestigial organs started de-atrophying and grew back in? <laughs> because you're able to make some kind of switch at some point where you're no longer translating the other language into your language in your head. Mm -hmm. You're just processing it instantly as right. itself. And Yeah, um, I don't think watching, it would take too long to get it back. Watching that with Amy Adams being this fantastic linguist... It made me a little sad because I I used to want to learn other languages and I you know I took Italian, and I wanted yeah. to learn these other languages and and I took German and French. Yeah, I mean you've got a bunch, but it it goes away. I, I never practice any of it, and my and when I do practice Spanish, oh gosh, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm terrible, and that makes me sad. But you know, in the 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 Ben Park stories, I always get to use a little bit of Spanish because. Mm -hmm. Half the characters, I think, are Mexican in, in those Western Arizona stories. It's fun to do that. But yeah, I just, I don't hear you do Portuguese and your writing at all. And so it was just like, oh, wow, listen to that. That's kind of cool. And you, you had the word for grandmother. Yeah. Or the, for grandma, I would assume. Yeah. And I, I, I thought that that was neat. It's a new side of you or a new, <laughs> I don't know what you call it. it just, but I don't know if it's outside your comfort zone, but it's just, yeah, it's a little bit wider than we have seen in your writing so that's the problem with it it's not a well-used language so you go outside of brazil and i think there's like two or three countries in africa and then portugal hmm. and uh coming across somebody from they, although weirdly uh I, I just went to my wife's christmas party the other night and there was somebody there that works with her that was from germany and she's like yeah this is my boyfriend leandro i was like oh hey nice to meet you and then I just sat down and was eating my food, and my wife was talking with the girl from Germany, and eventually she turns to me and goes, Hey, this, her boyfriend's from Brazil. He's, he's like, just, just been here for a short while. You want to talk to him? And it was, <laughs> hey, it was kind of weird, because, like, I don't know this guy at all, and now I'm supposed to come up with a conversation with him. But, uh, yeah, we tried to talk, and I had to talk with him in Portuguese, which, weirdly, for the most part, I remembered everything I wanted to say and w was fine. But uh, music was going, and there was a, a relative difficulty hearing what he said sometimes, which makes it really hard, you know, when you're already not speaking in your native language, and now you've got to do it through the thumping bass of LMFAO's party rocking in the house tonight. Uh, you know, it, it's much more difficult to try and do it. But I, I have to say that I performed admirably, actually had a conversation I was pretty impressed, considering that it's been 20 years. <laughs> Where did the abominable snowman come from in this story? Was that always part of your vision? Or is that something that you sort of was like, well... Uh... I mean, I always, always know. Originally, this is what I thought. I wanted to, A, turn people's expectations on their heads. So the thing that I have become known for is my characters dying at the end of the story. And, you know, I've got a collection of stories out there called A Small, A Very Small Pine Box, where it's all about babies who died at the end of the story. And that may be just a joke, but still, you know, I think a lot of people think that of me, and when they hear a story of mine that doesn't go there, it would be a surprise. And so I wanted, A, I wanted them to expect it to go there, and then B, I wanted to, you know, have it turn out to be something completely benign and uh, not dangerous or scary at all. So, like, when you asked me for music for the story, you're like, what kind of music should I put on? Is, is your story scary? And I thought, okay, well, yes, it's scary, but it's also not. Uh, I guess scary mu music would be fine. And then instead I, I realized how the story started and how it ended, and so I... And, Instead, changed it to Brazilian music. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw a curveball at everybody who would expect me to have these people just die at the end. Because that's, I guess, what I tend to do. Um, I do admittedly do that a lot, which I think it might be a failing of me as a writer. So, trying to do something where that doesn't happen, you know, it's a bit of a stretch for me. So, you know, the more you stretch, the more flexible you are. 
So I thought I would try it to to grow as a writer. Well, we um, got you to write a new story too, which Yeah, I haven't done that in a long time. Anymore. And it took a little doing to get going. You know, I thought about it and I had the first scene in my head for a while before I started writing, but then after that I was just like, okay, and then the Yeti comes and they fight. But yeah, that's just kind of what I was going for. And yeah, the abominable snowman was just a Christmas themed danger. You know, I guess I could have gone for Krampus, <laughs> but uh, seems like that uh, fad is a little played out. It's too bad. We enjoy singing the Krampus song every year. <laughs> The Christmas episode. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much what I was hoping to get out of this story. Just a switcheroo on everybody's like, okay, now they're going to die. What is he getting out of? Oh, it's probably a switch. Maybe this is Krampus and he's going to beat him to death with the reeds. Oh, yeah, here it comes. And then he's going to put him in their bag, take him to hell. But instead, he's just been conjured to get them together. And the boy hasn't... Uh, done something horribly wrong after all. You were nervous about this story, that it might offend people's sensibilities. Did, did, is that still the case, or now that it's done, you're like, oh, okay. There's a rainbow of Benetton different sensibilities out there, if you know what I'm saying, so it's hard to know. And I guess when it comes down to it, you can't write to try to not offend somebody's sensibilities, because there's always going to be somebody you can't predict. You can't know what their sensibilities are because every person is different. Yeah, somebody's auntie got molested by a Yeti. Right. And so they hate your story, but... Yeah, or somebody, you know, is from Brazil and they... Some macumbeiro murder, murdered their uh, family or so. I don't know. You know, just mentioning it could trigger them. <laughs> you never really know what's going to offend somebody. Well, my story has racial slurs in it. Yeah. And I didn't even consider that that might offend people because I just, just like, well, sorry guys, that, that, those are in there. Maybe we needed a trigger warning on there too, but I don't believe in trigger warnings either. God, they pretty much have to be in there for it to be, uh, not legitimate, authentic. but yeah, authentic, that's the word, you know, because it was said in 1949 and yeah, it was a different time, you know, yeah, we've, we've moved past that now, but uh, if, you, if you're not authentic then it will feel inauthentic and people are like oh yeah well that guy kind of sucks <laughs> what a terrible story all right he doesn't know anything about 1949 well I, how could i yeah i was six months old then <laughs> yikes well you you look surprisingly good for being 67 years old so keep doing whatever you're doing well i think this is probably come to the end of the episode. One thing you did with the last episode uh, that you hadn't done in a long, long time is you hid the outtakes on the page. Uh, and I would hope that you'd do that again on this episode. Oh, we got more to hide? Well, the, I'm, I've, I'm about to record an outtake for us. Oh, okay. Here it comes. All right. So, yeah, go go look for the outtakes then, folks, because they're there. And, and uh, we're going to say goodbye to you now and then record an outtake. Because... <laughs> That's the way you do things here at the Dune Steve. Uh, Not usually, no. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Big Anklevich. And I've been Rich Outfield. And, and let us know what you thought of this stuff. And if you want us to continue it as a tradition. Yeah, you and I have two new stories under our belts that we would not have had if it weren't for this non-contest. Yeah, this event. This event. spectacular! Yay! All right, folks, we'll, th we'll, we'll see you uh, next time. We'll see you on January 15th for the January 15th Spectacular! Be sure to uh, light your candles and... Be sure to light your Pez dispenser, <laughs> which is the traditional January 15th. Tradition. A traditional tradition. And also, observance. And also get out the spare tires and uh, spread them around your yard. All right? Because... Um, you don't want people to say that you, you didn't get the, the feeling of the season. That's right. <laughs> Nobody remembers the true meaning of January 15th anymore. It's yeah. just uh, sad in my day. <laughs> it was a real, it was, it was a big celebration in your day. Uh, back when you were born in 1949. All right, we'll see you later, folks. Thanks for listening. Good night.
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the file. So, there was one line in there, and it couldn't have been for anybody but me. Oh, yes, it was for you. But there was one line in there about the voice. Mm -hmm. I used that word just for you. And I have to admit, it was amusing, but also in a distracting way, because it's just like, what what other meaning could this be? Because she likes the voice. Why would she call it that? So I figured we'd tell the story behind that. (laughs) Sure, we could do that. Yeah. So The reason she says... I uh, had to pause the fucking voice. Oh, okay. it's because she had to pause it. Because you know, she was irritated that she, that that she had to stop and go answer the door because Billy Gilman was going. And apparently, I, I just looked this. I don't know <laughs> about the voice. I don't watch it. My wife watches it, but I just thought, okay, the voice is the big show, not American Idol anymore. So I needed to come up with somebody, and I, I tried. I just searched the voice heartthrob or something, and it came up with like the voice Australia has this really hot guy, and I was like, oh. Come on. Yeah, it took way more time than I should have to get the name of somebody. And then when I, uh, the next time my wife was watching The Voice and I saw Billy Gilman, she's like, oh, and he's such a dork and he's so lame or something like that. And I thought, oh, so he's not like the handsome, attractive guy that girls would be into? Oh, shoot. And you didn't change it? I didn't change it. No, I, I think I'd already even recorded the story at this point, so it was too late, but. Maybe he, you know, maybe that's just my wife's opinion and other people be like, oh, he's so hot. I think he's gay, though. Which... Well, that makes him hotter, doesn't it? Yes. Because he's non-threatening. Yes and no. I mean, I think, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Like, there was that movie where Jennifer Aniston liked the guy more because he was gay. Who's she... that objective of my of yeah, her affection? Yeah, I think so. And she tries to convert him over to to her side, which, of course, doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know what that does to girls they're like into a guy then they find out that he's gay and they're they're like does it deflate them or they're like oh i guess i can't like him or do they like him all the more who knows i don't know girls might be able to put it in the comments if you listened to the outtake (laughs) three people listen to the outtake and i guarantee none of them were girls well wendy cooper always listens to the outtakes that's because they say for wendy (laughs) okay so months ago we were set to run a story that I wrote called Like a Good Neighbor. And the origin of that story was that you had a friend at work whose daughter was a professional child actress. And you had mentioned to the mother that we did a podcast and we like to have people's voices and sometimes it's hard to get kids. And she volunteered her daughter to be on the show. And and if we ever do Like a Good Neighbor, we'll go into this in much, much, much more detail. Oh, and anyway, that never materialized. That never worked out. But I yeah, still I, wrote I, the story, and I finished it like two years later because there was no reason to finish it because it was like, yeah, she right. doesn't come into work anymore. Yeah, I'm she, never going to see that. She kid. moved away. Her daughter got like a big gig. Like she'd done small things. She had a part in a uh, Jonah Hill movie, and uh, she'd had you know little things. But then all of a sudden, she got a part on a sitcom, Disney sitcom, I think, and so she was gone for good and the mom was just like yes i can punch my ticket i don't gotta work no more i'll just go and try and see if i can keep all these hollywood producers from molesting my daughter and so yeah that became her full-time job i guess and they were off to la and we never saw her again um so yeah we never did that story and and maybe one day we still will it just uh was difficult to get all the voices and uh then i was just tired and i didn't want to edit it once we did get the voices which is mean because these people gave me their parts eventually <laughs> and I still haven't done anything with them but uh, a couple years later I was working on a made for tv movie a local one and maybe I'm remembering this wrong but I believe it was the sister of of this actress the the, the I used to know her name but it doesn't matter uh, that was going to be the main character in the story that I wrote she was the lead child actor in this production and I was working with her and uh, I mean, I was, I was just in the background really. And, but she, I was in between takes. She was talking about her sister's show, which was on Fox 
And if I squinch real hard, I can remember the name of the show, but it doesn't matter. Anyway. I don't want you to squinch anyways. Cause no, not in your car. Not yeah, with this seat. Seriously. Steamed up windows <laughs> enough as it is. Anyway, somebody's like, oh, I watched that show. Wow. And I was like, so is, is that fun? Is your sister doing good? And she's like, no. Fox canceled it because of the fucking voice. It was on at the same time. And it was just so weird to hear, I would say, like an eight or nine year old girl say the fucking voice. Like that, you know, in front with of a bunch the, of strangers. With the jadedness of like a 19 year old or something. Because like, of the fucking voice. Yeah. It's her, oh, she... And then she took a drag off of her cigarette. <laughs> but yeah, Fox canceled that show because it was on opposite the fucking voice. It's basically word for word what she said. And so I had to tell you <laughs> about that because it was darling. <laughs> Then here we are a couple of years later, and that phrase makes it into your story. So. Yeah, I put it in there just for you. You know, it was interesting because I was thinking about this the story, and I was like, because so far I pretty much have never shared any of my stories with my kids. Not because I don't want them to read them, but they're not for kids for the most part. Now that they've gotten old enough, I thought, you know, maybe I could share some of them with them. But they're also dark and downers at the ending and stuff like that and i'm not gonna like okay kids gather around daddy's gonna read you one of his stories uh, and i thought oh, well i wonder if i could do something with this one but yeah i don't know i'd have to take that word out for one and just say she had to pause the voice instead of the fucking voice and <laughs> probably change a few other things i might have to take the line about the big jugs out and uh how you can get anything you want in this world of big jugs Etc. <laughs> there might need some other uh, tweaks. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's a weird thing, man. But if you were publishing this, this if you were self-publishing the story, you think you'd take out the fucking voice line? Because it just it seems like that was there just to amuse me. It was. It was just to amuse amuse you. I might take that word out because I think it makes her seem a little shrewish or something like that. Angry, like overly angry over something small. So it might be better to remove it, especially since she's supposed to be a girl that this guy's got the hots for. And you want her to be like, yay, he finally got with that angry freak. But uh, I mean, eventually I will publish it. That's, uh, yeah, it's a weird thing. Like eventually my kids will probably get their hands on my stories and read them. Will it be like the moment in your story where, oh, now I'm playing with my dad when he was a child and I find out that he liked comic books. Will they bond with me when they finally get to read my stories? Or will they be, like, horrified and be like, Oh, my God. This was my dad? <sighs> I'm never visiting again. Daddy really hated us, didn't he, Mommy? <laughs> Why we, did he kill we, us at the end of every story? <laughs> we don't speak of him. <laughs> Anyways. Goodbye. Donate to the show. Please. <laughs>